My name is Joshua Von Trapp. It is my pleasure to be hosting you this afternoon here at the Salk Institute where the March of Dimes High School Science Week is a long tradition. In fact, this is our 31st annual event. We wish we could have you on campus with us, but we are proud to continue the event in a virtual space. Even so, Salk researchers look forward to this event and are eager to interact with you throughout the week. Some of you may have already taken advantage by submitting a question to our panelists ahead of time. Thank you so much. If you haven't yet, don't worry, I'll show you how to in just a few minutes. Now, Salk is not an acronym. It's actually named for Dr. Jonas Salk. You may have heard his name recently in the news as he was a key player in another public health crisis, the polio epidemic of the 40s and 50s. Dr. Salk developed a safe and effective polio vaccine, and then he went on to pursue another dream, which is to create a collaborative environment where researchers could explore the basic principles of life. 60 years later, the Salk Institute is a world-renowned basic biological research facility located in La Jolla, California, right across the street from UCSD. Gifted with 27 acres overlooking the Pacific Ocean by the city of San Diego in 1960, Salk partnered with architect Louis Kahn to design that collaborative environment where research could explore the basic principles of life and contemplate the wider implications of their discoveries for the future of humanity. He summarized his aesthetic objectives by telling Kahn to, quote, create a facility worthy of a visit by Picasso. It was once said by Louis Kahn's son, Nathaniel Kahn, the director of the Oscar-nominated movie, My Architect, quote, Concrete is the material of parking garages and overpasses and highways. But in the Salk Institute, the concrete has an enormous warmth to it and changes in beautiful ways as the sun moves around or the fog, fog rolls in. He goes on further to recall his father examining the sand that would go into the concrete under a microscope as he looked for the perfect hue. Quote, it couldn't be too green or too blue like most concrete. It had to have warmth, said Kahn. And as someone who has had the privilege of walking this campus, I can tell you the vision is warm and astounding. We hope we can once again invite you to our campus someday soon. Now let's go over our event schedule for today. The first part, two o'clock, you've already made it. You're here for our introduction and our program information from me, Salk Education Outreach. Very shortly, we'll dive into our virtual lab tour. Then we'll have a panel discussion where you can have your questions answered by our live panelists. And at the very end, we'll wrap up some closing remarks before three o'clock. Now, each lab tour is a standalone experience, so you're welcome to attend only those that align with your interests or all the events. We recommend checking out at least a few. You may be intrigued by a field you've never even considered. Each lab tour will have a separate link, and the recordings will be made available to registered attendees when they're available. Now, we're hopeful the event will run smoothly, but if you run into any technical issues, please be patient and just reach out to us at education at salk.edu. Now, our favorite part of this week is interacting with you, and we want to know what you are curious about. We'll be using student questions to guide our panel discussion. So to submit a question for the panel, click the link in the video description right below the video that you're watching right now. We thank you for your submissions. And we'll get to as many as we can. And if you'd like to read more about the lab's research, just click the show more option in the video's description. And on the event page, you'll find bios for our panelists, moderators, and you can click to learn so much more. You can even submit questions for an individual panelist there too. Now, there's awesome opportunities that we have for high school students. And one program I want to highlight first is our Heidoff Brody High School Summer Scholars. Now this is an eight week program, first week of a biotech boot camp with seven weeks in the lab for a paid internship. It's mentorship by Salk scientists, the opportunity to conduct real life research and develop science communication skills, industry visits, seminars, special events. Now, summer 2021 is to be determined based off public health. So please check our website for program status update in early March. You may notice from the pictures over there on the right hand side, there's one up at the top right. Every summer there is a salt picnic where everyone gets to join in together for community of events and activities, including our high school interns. So hopefully that will be a part of our coming summer. Now, whether public health allows for in-person hide off Brody, we also have another program that's virtually based that is open to even more students. This one is not limited to San Diego County students. The program is open to all US residents enrolled in high school during the 2021 academic year. This is a five week professional development opportunity for students called the Introduction to Research Science and Communication Virtual Program. It's about five to 10 hours a week, mostly asynchronous. Program elements include reading a journal article, analyzing data, 
preparing a scientific presentation in virtual labs. It ends with a final capstone project on a topic of your interest. It will be going on this summer 2021. And right now, if you'd like, we have a program lottery opt-in that will close on March 31st, 2021. Just go to our website and you'll be able to find that and opt in. Our team and our scientists provide feedback throughout the process to build skills that will support students in future academic and professional STEM settings. We look forward to seeing your opt-in come into our inbox. Now, I know I've shared a lot of information with you, so if you have any questions about our programs, feel free to reach out to us via email, education at salk.edu, or if you wanna click and find out more about those programs, like the Hydoff Brody in person, or our Introduction Research Science, our virtual program, just head to salk.edu slash education. Now we are very thankful that this day is even possible, so we wanna give a big thank you to some of our sponsors. The March of Dimes High School Science Day is made possible through the very generous support of the Anne and Neil Blue High School Science Fund. Our sincere thanks to the Blue family and the supporters, partners, and volunteers that make South Education Outreach possible, including the March of Dimes. Now today, our virtual lab tour will feature the Molecular Neurobiology Laboratory under the direction of Shrek Chalasani. The video will give you a glimpse of what a day in the life of a scientist is like. And each video was designed and filmed by the scientists, so each one is unique to the lab. And the videos will highlight some of the technology and techniques our scientists use, but also introduce you to the people that work there and some potential career options if you'd like to go into a STEM field. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce, introduce to you the Molecular Neurobiology Laboratory under the direction of Shrek Chalasan. Associate Professor in the Molecular Neurobiology Laboratory at the Salk Institute. And in my laboratory, we use the invertebrate model C. elegans and the vertebrates zebrafish and mice to study how the brain generates behavior. So today, you're going to hear from three of our fantastic scientists. You're going to hear from Molly Mahi, who's a postdoctoral fellow, and research assistant Sahana Chakraborty and John Patel. And they're going to tell you about the experiments that they are doing. And once uh, you have seen those sections, you would also have a chance to ask them a couple of questions at the very end. So I think it should be a fun video and a fun interaction with us. At the same time, we look forward to hearing from you. Hi everyone, my name is Janki Patel and I'm a recent college graduate and now a research assistant in the Chalasani lab at the Sol. I knew I wanted to study the brain since I was a very young kid. My grandpa would always say, your brain is your strongest weapon. And for some reason that stuck with me all this time. Following my neuroscience ambition, I worked in a neurobiology lab as an undergrad and that fueled my already bright fire. Today, I'm going to show you guys how I can make cells, which normally sit quietly, respond and glow to ultrasound. I am going to give cells a piece of information in the form of DNA, which will make the cells glow when I turn an ultrasound stimulus on. So let's get started. These are some human embryonic kidney cells and they live in a tea flask because it's shaped like a tea in the incubator. 
I'm going to now move the cells from the tea flask onto this small circular glass so I can easily carry it to the microscope for imaging on day 3. I want to put about 300,000 cells on each glass plate, so I'm going to count how many we have in a mill using this little fancy machine and do some quick math, which sometimes can be very difficult. Here we have a 12 hour plate and I've put a glass plate in each of them. After putting 300,000 cells in each plate, I will give them some food, which is this red liquid, and we'll put them back in the incubator. So this is the next day. The cells have gotten to know their environment and are ready to get to work. I'm going to give them all the information they need to make a protein that will get them to glow in response to ultrasound. This information is delivered in the form of DNA. We will give them a day to make the protein and tomorrow they should be ready to image. I am gently loading the cover slip onto the holder. The transducer is sitting right below this. And because the cells love this red warm media, I'm just going to pour some over them. All I have to do now is hit trigger and in about 20 seconds we'll see the cells jump a little bit. A better understanding of all this will allow us to develop therapeutic tools for treating neurodegenerative diseases and many other diseases like diabetes and chronic pain that affects a large population of the world. This is very exciting and makes me jump out of bed every single morning. And of course, I absolutely love the people I work with every single day. They're so smart and supportive and we have so much fun doing cool science every single day. And I'm so grateful for all of that. Hey guys, my name is Lahana Chakravorty and I'm a research assistant here at the Salk Institute. So as a research assistant, I have a lot of responsibilities and those include coming up with new ideas for experiments and ideas for projects, as well as assisting others with their current projects that they have ongoing. Part of my job as a research assistant here is to be a member of the Sano team, which comes from the word Sano genetics. In that project, I'm trying to understand what frequencies of ultrasound certain cells will respond to. In addition to my job as a research assistant, Assistant. I'm also lucky enough to actually have my own research project, which uh, involves trying to understand the genetic foundation of autism spectrum disorders. So today what I will be showing you in lab is a procedure that we use very frequently for multiple experiments. It's called immunohistochemistry. So that's a very big word, so we can break that down. Um, immuno comes from the use of antibodies. Histo comes from the actual tissues themselves, so maybe your brain or a different organ. And then chemistry, of course, stems from the word and use of chemicals in these experiments. So here we have a brain from a mouse that we stimulated with ultrasound. We want to see how the ultrasound may have affected its neuronal proteins. I'm going to freeze the brain now in this little box so that I can cut it into thin slices later. This is our cryostat. Cryo comes from the fact that the inside of this machine is kept at negative 20 degrees Celsius to keep the tissue intact. I'm going to cut the brain into thin slices of about 20 micrometers. So how does antibody labeling work? When our body fights an infection, it makes antibodies, which recognize foreign particles and mark them for destruction. Let's say we want to label some animal tissue. First, we label the tissue, which is known as the antigen, with something called a primary antibody. Then we tag the primary antibody with something called a secondary antibody. This antibody has a fluorophore attached to the end, which is a fluorescent molecule that emits a certain wavelength of light when stimulated by a different wavelength of light. Now back to lab. Here I am very carefully putting the tissues onto the slides. The slides are ready to cover and seal. Now we're gonna turn on the microscope, shine the laser, and ta-da! Now we can see some proteins. The 
there's so many things that are really exciting about science, so many things to learn and discover. Um, and the more I learn about science, the more I want to go out and do science. The more I do science, I want to learn even more about science. And sometimes you get results that aren't necessarily what you expected. They're quite different from what you expected. And you know, that might feel like a failure, but the good thing about science is that actually, nothing is really a failure. You know, you get one result and you take note of it and you add that and you adjust your question. You come up with a better question maybe, or a different question even, and you pursue that next. So there's never a failure, there's always just a motion forward, uh, discovering something new. Hi, I'm Molly Maddie, and I'm a postdoc in the Chawal Sani lab here at the Salk Institute. A postdoc is kind of like even more school after a lifetime of school. After my PhD, I knew that I wanted to keep learning and I wanted to keep doing science uh, because my eventual career goal is to work at a college training undergraduates on how to do cool research, how to think through research problems, and teach uh, science classes. One of my favorite parts about my job is probably that I get to mentor undergraduates and um, just solve problems. Um, I know it seems kind of hokey to, to like to solve problems, but I just sometimes see a connection somewhere and want to be able to directly interrogate that connection and see if it's real or see what's the cause of that connection. And, and that's what I get to do in, in science. So what I'm going to show you today is an experiment that I do in the lab quite often, and it helps me answer the question of um, what is going on inside an animal as it makes decisions. So let's say that you and your friends in a post-pandemic world are at the mall. You know at the food court there's a taco shop, and you really want that taco. But now let's say that there's a pit of snakes between you and the taco stand. Would you go across that pit of snakes to get your taco? We can ask this question in a much simpler way using a model organism called Cynorhabditis elegans, or C. elegans, which are a one millimeter long worm. So here you can see the experimental setup for the sensory integration assay. We will have assay plates that have a diacetyl odor on them, which is a popcorn smell that worms love. There's also copper sulfate in a line that has been dripped down and dried into the middle of the plate. This is a repellent. The worms hate copper. So what we can do in this experiment is ask what is normal wild type? How often do they decide to get to that flavor, that compound, that taco that they really like, um, even when there's something really scary preventing them from getting there? So we'll place down a population of worms, typically about 100 worms. And then I wait 45 minutes. I then look at the same plate and observe where the worms are. We want to be able to quantify or count or measure these results. To do this, we use a number called the chemotactic index. Chemotaxis is the movement toward an attractive stimulus or away from something repellent. The way we calculate chemotactic index is we count the number of worms on the side with the odor and divide that by the total number of worms that are on that plate. What we see is usually wild type animals that have been well fed and not stressed their entire lives will only cross that barrier to get to that smell that they really like about 20% of the time. Now, if we overly stress the worms um, by perhaps starving them from food, food depriving them, then we see that the animals will cross the copper barrier, that toxic repellent, to get to the thing that they want um, almost 80% of the time. I really like talking about this assay because it lets us realize that, that we are a combination of not just our genetics and our environment, but also our internal states. So what's going on inside us, biochemically, 
metabolically, neurologically, what's going on inside. What I hope to do with these worms in this super simplified model system is really understand um, bigger biological questions like how do we make decisions and what controls choice. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoyed our video. Good luck with everything. Bye. All right, hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Nadia Hagani and I will be your moderator for today. And it is really, truly so great to uh, eventually get your questions and then spark the discussion from it. And I'm really excited to see what these panelists have to say. And so we'll start with introductions. So as I said, we're gonna do our name, where everyone is from and what our role is in the lab. And so as I said, I'll go first. So my name is Nadia Hagani. I am from San Diego and I'm actually a third year undergraduate student. So I'm at UC San Diego and um, I'm studying general biology and I'm also an intern at the Salk Institute in the lab. And I'm really interested in how skin microbes can elicit behavioral changes in the host organism. And so I'll pass it on to Ahana and then we'll go from there. Hi, I'm Ahana, um, Dr. Wardy. I am a research assistant in the lab and like Nadia, I'm also from San Diego. I also attended UC San Diego as an undergrad two years ago now. Um, I studied biochemistry and cell biology. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, I'm a research assistant. I have a lot of different responsibilities, kind of what I mentioned in the video that you guys all just saw. Um, and I'm excited to answer everyone's questions today. I believe that I'll introduce myself next. Um, my name is Molly Maddie. Um, you can call me Dr. Maddie at first, but I will always tell you to just call me Molly. Um, I'm from Port St. Joe, Florida, which is in rural Northwest Florida. And I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Salk Institute. And I'm so excited that you're all here today. Um, last one. Hi, I'm John Key. I am a research assistant at the Chalasani lab. I am from India, so I'm a little far from home, but science is wonderful and I absolutely love being here. And I'm so excited to talk science with you guys. All right, great. So now that we've all introduced ourselves, we're gonna dive right into our first question. And so I, I hope that everyone would answer this question. I think it's a great starter. So the question is, how did you figure out what type of scientist you wanted to be? Maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Maddie or Molly. <laughs> Thanks, Nadia. Yeah, so I was very fortunate at a young age to have um, a family that really fostered my love of nature. Both my mother and father forced and allowed me to go on nature walks and explore the outdoors in a variety of ways, whether it be on the beach or um, in a forest, a cypress swamp, perhaps. Um, we were always walking around and they encouraged me to pick up bugs and you know, look at moss and ferns and taught me the scientific names of a lot of these um, organisms that I was coming in contact with. And so turning a nature walk into a scientific um, learning experience was something that that I had from a very young age. So I've kind of always known I wanted to be a biologist. Um, and biologists just study living things. And so when I was young, my parents told me that if I wanted to be a biologist, I had to pick one living thing and study it for the rest of my life. And like, that is so daunting, mom and dad. Um, I could not decide what organism I wanted to study. I was like, bees, no, alligators, no, Gila monsters, no, ferns. And um, it wasn't until I was in 10th grade at Port St. Joe High School where I found out that I could study genetics and by studying genetics or the DNA inside living things that I could study every living thing just by studying the T's, the A's, the G's and the C's that twirl and whirl around inside every um, living, living thing. So that's kind of my trajectory into wanting to study biology and then going into genetics. That's really wonderful. I also admire your 
<laughs> your desire to study more than one thing. And I think that is also reflected in what you're doing today and what you did in graduate school and now in your postdoc. And so maybe uh, Hana or Jonki, if you'd like to go next. Um, I can go next if Jonki, if you don't mind. Um, uh, I think like Molly, I also like, you know, from a young age, I really enjoyed um, all things related to biology, which started from a trip to the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, in Northern California, uh, where I saw these giant like jellyfish and I was like, wow, these things look like plastic bags, but they're alive. And it was a crazy thing to think about, uh, just how things are so different. Um, and how life in general is something so broad that we can study. So that was really cool to me. And so I was like, okay, cool. I love biology, done. Um, but then in um, undergrad, I studied biochemistry and cell biology, like I mentioned before. Um, and I, I like that because again, I like biology. I went in thinking I kind of like chemistry. So I'm just gonna pick that as my major and study that. Um, but it wasn't until I actually started working in a lab, um, particularly with my first internship at uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, where I learned, or I worked in um, a neuroscience, with a neuroscience team. I didn't know anything about neuroscience. Uh, it had nothing to do with my major. So this was something completely new that I was introduced to. Um, and as I worked through it, I realized that, wow, this is really cool. Um, I still don't have any background in it, but it just so happens that both my experience at Janssen and then now at the Chalasani lab, both times I've been immersed in neurobiology and neuroscience. Um, so I wouldn't say that I know specifically what type of scientist I will still want to be um, when I grow up. Maybe who knows like what's going to happen. But for now, I think just those like sort of fortunate experiences that I've had and that little background in love for biology that I already had developed. I think those kind of helped me figure out in what general direction I wanted to go. Um, so yeah, just some fun, cool little experiences that built up my love for science and biology and neuroscience. That's wonderful. And then Janki. Did you have uh, an answer for this one as well? Yeah, but mine's not as interesting as these guys. Um, I remember one day right before bed, my dad is a doctor and he was just looking at like an MRI of the brain and he was like, oh, whoa, something's wrong with it. And to me, it looked perfectly fine. I was like, this looks great. Apparently there was a pretty big tumor. The midline was shifted, meaning that the center of the brain was no longer at the center of the body and stuff. And I was like, whoa, I really don't understand the brain. And he was like, oh, maybe try and study it. I'm like, cool, I will. <laughs> um, and that's how I got into neuroscience. And my brother studied computer science and he would always talk about artificial intelligence. Just then the computer came out that was playing chess with a human and one. Um, and then we started trying to mimic the brain, but I was like, we don't understand the brain. How are we going to make something do things like our human brain? And, um, and that led me to do neuroscience as an undergrad and I've never looked back. I love it. That's awesome. So maybe going along the lines of what you're doing now and what you did in undergrad, um, there was another question that I wanted to ask that was asked, um, pre the pre before. And so the question is, are scientists just assigned to a specific experiment or hypothesis? Or do you get to completely design your own research and just use the lab facilities to assist with that? So maybe um, in the past answering that question, then answering that question now, maybe there's a change in that. And this could be for anyone. Yeah, I would say that all of those uh, possibilities um, happen in every research lab and for any person in different uh, environments. So as a postdoctoral research fellow, I have a lot more training um, than uh, say an undergraduate in, in the lab. And so I have a lot more freedom to design my own experiments and come up with my own hypotheses and use the materials available to me to answer the questions that I want to answer. Um, I still definitely use uh, other people's ideas and input and, and intelligence to help answer my questions. Um, and when I was in undergrad, I definitely was uh, more often just given a task to repeat over and over again for the person that I was working with. Um, and that's great because it gave me the expertise in that task that I could then take to my next experience um, and be a little bit more independent. So I've, I have been building independence throughout my academic uh, career. Um, how about y'all? I think um, it does It does vary um, based on like, I guess like what role you have in the lab, like a postdoctoral fellow versus an undergrad versus a research assistant. Um, so for, as a live example, when I joined the Chalasani lab, I was originally 
supposed to just work with C. elegans um, and uh, specifically on the autism uh, project, which just happened to be sitting around um, waiting for things to get done. Uh, but because I had prior experience working with mice, uh, it was suggested that maybe I could also join the SANA genetics team, um, which Jonathan also works on. So uh, the autism spec or the autism spectrum disorder project, for example, has a little bit more independence for me. So um, you know, I, I can work directly with my PI and I can work directly with the research scientists and other collaborators and sort of figure out what it is that I need to do next, um, what direction I want to take my experiments in and, and so on and so forth. Um, but Sana Genetics, it's a larger team of different individuals doing different things um, and we all collaborate together. So I'd say there's a little less independence in that, but much more teamwork and uh, a larger avenue for bouncing off of ideas and um, working together for the same sort of project. I guess these guys covered it. I think the one thing that I've also noticed is um, in different labs have different roles for the research assistants as well. You can be a research assistant at a certain lab and have completely different kinds of roles and um, mentorship and independence compared to a different kind of lab. And even in the same lab, it really depends on where the project is. Right now we have a paper in review and stuff. So everyone's working towards just that. And there's there's no time to think about anything, like all hands on gear for the paper. So yeah, it really is very situ situational, I would say. Yeah, definitely. And maybe I'll speak a little bit uh, to this question. I myself am an undergraduate student, so I'm maybe closer to age than some of the high schoolers that are watching. And when you first get into lab, you don't know much about techniques. You don't know much about what you're doing. So you're kind of just getting yourself situated in lab, getting the experience you need to eventually be able to get the independence that our research assistants have and our postdoc, Dr. Maddie has. All of these people now have their own independent projects or working independently in lab. And so it's something that you build up and you really actually you want to be given tasks at the beginning because you're an undergrad or you're a high school student and you don't know what you're doing, but you build up and it's really great to see the progress. So I think we'll move on to another question that was submitted. And the question is, what specific parts of the brain are you researching? Like specific glands or regions or more on a cellular level? And maybe this would go to either Jonki or Ahana who are working specifically on the brain. I think Ahana and I are both really trying to understand how a neuron works at this point in our project. Um, but hopefully in the future, once we're able to understand sonogenetics better, we'll be able to answer more questions about how brain regions work and why, um, what goes wrong in neurodegenerative diseases. Um, Ahana, do you have anything to add? Um, not particularly. I think, uh, you know, just to clarify, of course, a neuron is like one of the basic units of the brain. So uh, really understanding the very baseline foundational aspects of the brain is really what will help us move forward in the future to understand more complex um, parts of the brain. Um, so yeah, I think, and of course, other, other labs have very specific regions of the brain that they might be focusing on. But for our case, we're a little bit more um, in the beginning, I suppose, of that. Yeah, definitely. And um, maybe I'll, I'll direct a little towards Molly, but C. elegans does not have a brain, correct? They have a set of neurons in their head. <laughs> that's, what I'll, that's how I'll say it. I see. Okay. So, but you can still study certain aspects of the brain in this organism, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, their neurons age and their neurons fire to each other in similar ways. Um, their neurons are used to uh, make decisions and move and, you know, um, search for mates or search for food. Um, so many of the basic processes that, that happen in neurons in any organism are happening inside the neuron of a tiny one millimeter long worm. Great, okay. Um, I think, so there's another question that was submitted and this is a, I think a fantastic question. So it is, what motivates you when you have difficult times with different research? And I think we've all had difficult times in our research uh, before. So 
don't uh, whoever can go first maybe we'll fight over who can answer that's, this one yeah so that is a really good question um i will admit i probably have at least one difficult time every day almost um because science you know especially biology things don't always go the way that you think that they will um even when there's like a lot of established literature on something maybe for whatever reason you're doing an experiment that has been done so many times and for some reason the results are completely different um, and maybe you're doing it wrong, or maybe you don't know what's wrong, and and maybe like it it is what it is. Uh, so uh, um, basically, you know, like you have to remember that there is this broad um, field that you're contributing to. Everything that you do has an impact, uh, whether you get results that are completely like out out of the field or res results that actually um, are very useful, results that can be built upon further everything that you do has like its own little mark um and it everything that is done in the lab basically will have some sort of application uh whether it's developing new drugs or um, developing therapeutics or just just i guess generating more knowledge in um general so just that i guess fact at the back of your head that you are a part of something larger is what can potentially help you get over that sort of difficult time that you're having and just like take a deep breath, step back and be like, okay, this is what I need to do next. So I'm just gonna do it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ignore the fact that I might be having a mental breakdown right now, but it happens to everyone. Um, you just, you gotta rely on people around you and you have to have confidence in yourself to know that you're doing something important. Yeah, and yes, Ahana, if I can um, add to that, that, you know, even sometimes when you're doing an experiment, when I'm doing an experiment and I fail in my experiment, um, whether it be my controls don't look the way they're supposed to, or um, I can't replicate data that I've previously done, I think of everything as a learning experience. Um, I had a really great mentor in grad school who used that term kind of um, jokingly uh, and called all terrible things learning experiences, but even terrible things can be learning experiences. Um, and to take that even a step farther into something more fun for me, whenever I'm losing motivation in what I'm doing and, and my day-to-day -day in lab, I go and I talk to other people about what I'm doing, whether it be my lab mates like Nadia and Ahana and Junkie, or whether it be my mom or uh, one of my friends um, who you know isn't quite a scientist, but works in the medical field um, that I can, you know, say, hey, I did this thing today and this is why it kind of matters. And it like reinvigorates me to want to do more work. Um, so not only sharing like this struggle, but also sharing the learning experience. Um, so yeah, that's what motivates me. Okay, great. I think you both spoke for all of us. Um, I went back into lab recently for the first time and something that was supposed to take maybe an hour and a half took four hours and it's just everything is a learning experience so on to the next question what college classes did you take that helped you to get to where you are um i think i did a lot of molecular biology classes um and a lot of neuroscience classes that really helped me I, they Again, the things you learn in classes is like just the beginning of what research gets into, but but that is so important because it's such a good foundation for, you know, just knowing how neurons are talking to one another, like how cells in the brain are talking to one another. And if you understand that very well, you can start asking questions and interpret data when you get it. So I think um, Specifically, it was there was a cellular neurobiology class. There was a molecular biology class I took that helped, that's helped me a lot. There was a class on stress and mental disorders that's helped me. Um, neuroanatomy, yeah, those I would think were one of the top ones. Yeah, that sounds good. And maybe they're all um, towards your major. And yeah, of course. So there's another question, and I think this one is directed to Ahana. So it's talking about autism. So if a C. elegans has some of the autism-linked genes, does it impact their behavior? If so, how? And maybe you can speak a little about your uh, project in lab. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, of course, how do you translate something that's 
very human into something so like small um, and basic as the elegans. Um, so the first thing that you want to do basically is kind of understand what is it that you're looking for? Like what, what sort of behavior in humans do you know um, that, of, that are like associated with autism spectrum disorders? So for example, young children with autism often display um, an aversion to social in interactions and encounters. Um, and so maybe they don't make eye contact with individuals or they avoid large gatherings and groups. So that's uh, something that we can kind of simplify into a behavior we might see in a worm. So avoiding large groups. So avoiding um, other clumps of worms, for example, or something like that. Um, in my case specifically, something that I study with my project uh, is related to avoidance of toxic repellents, uh, sort of kind of like what Molly mentioned in her video with uh, copper. Um, so again, individuals with autism spectrum disorder, uh, like along the autism spectrum disorder may display, um, maybe they're not as, I guess, able to avoid things that are bad for them. So maybe they might put themselves in a situation that isn't necessarily where they should be, or um, it isn't gonna help them, or it's gonna make things worse for them. So how do we translate that to this copper sort of um, toxic repellent that C. elegans might encounter? Uh, basically what we do is we have these genes um, related to autism spectrum disorders. Um, they're just implicated in literature by other scientists um, saying like, hey, this gene seems like it is present in both C. elegans and both humans, and it might cause autism in humans. So what we do is we mutate that gene in C. elegans. We might remove the gene completely, or we might make a single change that causes that gene to no longer function. Um, so then we compare this mutated worm to a wild type worm, which has no mutations, no changes. So it should, whatever behavior it displays, that's kind of what we consider to be the normal behavior that we expect to see. So if I put a drop of copper in front of this mutated worm, it will continue swimming through the, the little drop. Whereas a wild type worm will actually avoid it because it knows that that is a toxic repellent. It does not want to be anywhere near it. So this mutated worm instead will just not recognize that. And then the next step basically is to kind of ask, why didn't it recognize that? What is causing it to behave um, in a different manner from what is normally seen uh, in the wild? So it's sort of like a back and forth. Like we take one thing from humans, put it into a C. elegans, and then once we see that behavior, we go back to humans and say like, oh, this gene might be important. Um, what is this gene cause? Like what behavior is it causing in humans um, versus C. elegans? So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the best parts about science and using C. elegans as a model system is you can do all of that stuff that seems impossible, but you can study things like autism and in these small worms. <laughs> so next question, um, maybe to Molly, is there anything you would tell your past self who had who have who had just been working in a lab? I think about talking to my past self all the time. Um, I wish I could go back in time and and talk to you know any any age Molly and say sage advice. Um, so my my main points, my main things that I wish first time in lab Molly would have done is one, taken like really good notes. Um, you always think you're going to remember the thing that you're doing but you don't. I promise you. Just take really good notes, ideally somewhere that you can access them easily later. In the time of Google Drive, I highly suggest a Google Doc. Um, two, ask more questions. I was so afraid to ask questions because I was afraid of looking dumb. Um, I would sit in lectures, uh, seminars by top you know, elite scientists, and just think of my questions and write them down in my notebook. And would never ask them. And it wasn't until I realized that professors were sometimes asking the exact same questions that I had written down in my notebook that I actually had pretty good questions and I wasn't missing something and I wasn't being dumb. And so in addition to asking those questions, not beginning those questions with, I might have missed this, but, or this might be a stupid question, but, um, but rather just being confident and saying, hey, can you explain more how NLG1 indicates autism in worms? I would like to know more. Um, and then also, this is just advice for, for me all the time that I wish I would take, is to just slow down, reflect. 
and read a lot. <laughs> so that's, if, if you're listening 20, 2013, Molly, that's, that's my advice. <laughs> that's great advice. Maybe I'll take that. <laughs> we'll move on. And I think this is a great question as well. What is the most interesting part of your job? And let's go with, let's start with Molly. Oh man, I thought I was gonna have more time to muse about this. Um, so the most interesting part of my job is probably, well, you all already heard about the buttery popcorn stuff. That's pretty interesting that just like you and me, these worms really like the smell of buttery popcorn. They think they're at a movie theater and they're hanging out. Um, and. I think the most interesting thing about my job is um, as a postdoc, I do have a little bit more um, independence in not only in terms of that I can do my own experiments and kind of determine the course of my own research, but also independence in how I spend my day. So I get to teach. Um, I'm guest lecturing at UCSD um, next next week for a few classes. And, um, you know, I can do things like this in the middle of my day. Um, and through a lot of uh, programming through education outreach, I've had the opportunity to think about my research in a way that is applicable to society. Um, so just like in the video, I shared that these worms, uh, just like you, are a combination of your environment and your genetics and your internal states. And so uh, something that I think about a lot in the school um, setting is that if your classmate is behaving erratically, it might be because of an internal state that you're unaware of. They might be hungry or they might be stressed or being abused at home. So um, to kind of it's, it's interesting to be able to use this um, this worm as a way to talk about deeper things um, that I probably wouldn't be able to think about if I were only working in the lab. But the fact that I'm able to go to things like this and work with education outreach and, and local schools, I begin to think about my work in a broader context. And for me, that's the most interesting part of my job. Yeah. That's great. And I, I always believe that science is more than just research. Uh, it's everything. It's communicating, it's writing, it's presenting. Um, and so with that, we're going to go to our final question. What is something you look for in a mentor? And this will be great for the high school students watching. And what? Uh, let's have everyone answer this one. Um, I can go first. Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, and that was one that I asked myself when I was first interviewing for the position in the Chalasani lab. Uh, I think everyone that I met on that day, I asked them sort of what, um, what kind of environment they thought of the lab, what they, what their expectations were of what they were doing, so, sort of so I could get an understanding of what kind of uh, community and environment the lab was basically. Because in a mentor, obviously you want them to like be knowledgeable about things so that when you're stuck on something, you can ask and they can either help you, maybe they already know the answer um, and they can save you some time or they can help you uh, go in the right direction to find the right answer. Um, but in addition to that, you want someone that you want to be able to like rely on for just life in general, because um, in a lab environment, it's a working environment. We were all, we all, I mean, pre-pandemic, I suppose we would all spend many hours together in close proximity, talking to each other, having engaging with each other, having fun. Um, now, even like, you know, in a more virtual sort of setup, that still exists. Um, you know, we can still call each other up or see like one or two people in lab in person. Um, and it just, while you're working and you're doing research and you're doing all these sort of cool things, um, sometimes you need a break. Sometimes you need someone to kind of pull you away and be like, hey, you need to take time for yourself, which John Key and Molly and you guys, all, you, everyone does for me sometimes when I get too immersed in the multiple projects that I'm in. Um, and that's just really important because you want to be able to function as a person um, and remember that you can't, you're not a machine that isn't just like continuously working. So, so basically, yeah, um, just having someone there that can help you with science, can help you with problems in your life, and is just someone that you want to talk to and have fun with sometimes. Yeah, and I would say that there's also an importance of um, kind of informal mentors. Um, so not only should your boss or your PI, as we call them, um, 
should they be you know what you're looking for in a mentor but you should also seek out mentors outside of your boss um and to me a mentor is anybody that's in a stage of life or career that's like one step above where you are now um, so I have some amazing mentors, um, postdocs in the lab that I was a graduate student in, who I still reach out to all the time with varied questions about academia or life or science or careers. And um, just having people who I can informally chat with about my future and where I am right now is so important. So I would say somebody who is approachable and um, open for future discussions, not just like a person that I used to see every day, but somebody that I can still talk to um, thousands of miles apart. Um, yeah, I think Ahana and Molly uh, summed it up pretty well. If a friend and a mentor is great. Someone who cares about you and looks out for you. Um, your progress in lab, beyond lab, and your mental health in lab keeps up your confidence, you know, as your cheerleader, because you're going to have days where you don't feel good in lab. They keep you going. Um, all of that is important. Yeah. And a friend, because, you know, you see them every day, you spend a lot of time and you you go through so much, you it becomes like family. Like I expect and I always say this, like lab members are always and will always be my family away from home. So, you know, it's it's important that you, you get along with them. Yeah. And I'll add on to that really briefly that you all are my mentors as well. As a college student, you have professors, you have scientists in your lab, and all of them kind of come together and give you advice in one way or another. This has just been awesome. Thank you, Junkie. Thank you, Ohana. Thank you, Dr. Molly. Thank you, Nadi, for giving up your time and sharing your talents with us. Thank you to our audience for asking of your questions, hearing nature-inspired childhoods, hearing about school and mentors to work that truly matters. This has been an awesome experience. Thank you. And as well, that advice to ask more questions. Yes, as a former classroom teacher, I cannot encourage that more. And especially being at a place where questions can possibly prompt a cure, that's just an inspirational place to be. So keep asking those questions. Come back tomorrow and join us. And we hope to see you for our virtual rest of our March of Dimes High School Science Week and hopefully someday in person. Thanks so much for joining. And we'll see you later on. Bye, friends. <laughs>